Hi, I'm Dr. Joseph Camo, Associate Professor of Sociology at Georgia Southwestern State University. And in this video, I'm going to define prejudice, discrimination, and racism. Now, prejudice, as the name would suggest, involves prejudging individuals or groups based on some sort of status or characteristic they possess, but it's typically seen as judging them based on something that's not appropriate. Now, as an instructor, if I have a student who does good work in my classes, they write well, they do well in their tests, to judge them as a good student or a talented or capable student or assume that about them is not really prejudging them based on something that is not relevant. I've seen their work, I've seen the work they do, and I've seen this as a capable student. Now, when we talk about prejudice in this context, what we really mean is prejudging someone based on some sort of status they possess or some kind of group that they're a part of, for example, sex or race or social class or some other group like that. So for example, if you assume that someone had some negative personal trait, perhaps you assume that they were dishonest or not hardworking because of some sort of group that they're part of, race, class, or what have you, you are engaging in prejudice. You don't know that person, you don't know their qualities they possess, but you're assuming something because you're associating it with the group they're part of. But for it to be prejudice, it's more of a mindset. It's an opinion. It's prejudging. So discrimination, on the other hand, involves some sort of unfair treatment. Now, prejudice involves attitudes and opinions, and prejudice may not always lead to discrimination, but it many times does. But prejudice is a prerequisite to discrimination. So when a person has some sort of prejudice, they may then, in some way, act on that. For example, housing discrimination. Maybe you own a property and you're looking to rent it out and you have a great applicant on paper who is of a particular racial or ethnic group that you may have negative opinions about and you decide not to rent to them because of your prejudice. Well, you have then discriminated. Now, discrimination can involve withholding opportunity or access based on some sort of attitude or opinion, but it can also involve excess or undue punishment. Perhaps you are an educator and you have a bias against men or women or a particular racial or ethnic group and you grade them just a little more harshly in a way that really isn't fair. That would then be discrimination. So again, discrimination involves an action, some sort of withholding of opportunities or imposing excess consequence, but it's unfair treatment. It's sort of prejudice with legs. Now, the last one we're gonna talk about is racism, and this is a tricky one because there's a lot of different ways to define racism. There's tons of research out there, and I'd encourage you to look into that, but I'm gonna kind of narrow it down to these three larger categories that I think encompass a lot of the different types of racism that are out there. And I call these the three I's of racism, the letter I. The first one is interpersonal racism. You could also call it individual racism. These are sort of those individual acts of racism where a person has a negative attitude or opinion towards a person based on their race and acts out on that. This could be comments that are inappropriate. This could be discriminatory treatment. This is sort of an individual act that one person does, an individual act of racism from one person towards another person or other group of people. Now, the second type of racism is one that you may be heard of, and this is institutional racism, sometimes also called structural racism. Now, this is less about an individual negative attitude and more about structures in society that have racially inequitable outcomes. You could say that it does not necessarily need to have racist people for there to be institutional racism. Often it does involve that. But sometimes there's a rule or a law or a social process or a policy that's in place where the origins of that might have been really kind of innocent. They created a rule for some purpose and didn't realize that it was gonna have some sort of outcome that led to racially inequitable results. Now, let me be clear, many times, institutional racism did start with a racist intent. I am not saying that it's not ever there, but it's not a necessary prerequisite. Sometimes the origin for this policy may not have been racially intended, but sometimes it was. But what makes it institutional racism is not the intent, it is the outcome. A famous example of this are the different sentencing for crack cocaine and powder cocaine. You can research that to get more information on that. But crack cocaine, because of the war on drugs era, had a harsher sentence than powder cocaine. But what also came with that was that crack cocaine was in an epidemic that was hitting predominantly in communities of color. 
So when people were arrested for having possession of crack cocaine compared to powder cocaine, there were longer sentencing because there were longer mandatory minimums. And those longer mandatory minimums were more likely to be faced by people of color. Now, there's a lot of debate about the origins of this. Some say that it was just trying to get crack off the streets. Others attribute it to the industrial prison complex and trying to fill prisons. That's a long debate. I would encourage you to check out the documentary 13th. It gets into that a bit more. But the point is, regardless of the origin, with the or whether the origin was racially intended or not, the result of this mandatory minimum is that people of color were in prison for longer because of crack cocaine. So this is one of many examples of institutional racism. It's processes, structures, and laws in society that lead to racially inequitable outcomes. It's not necessarily about the attitudes or opinions of people. In fact, it's important to understand this because even if you could erase all racist attitudes or opinions or intent, those structures could still remain. They have to be dismantled structurally. So institutional racism is that second eye. Now the third one is one that you maybe haven't heard of, it's a little bit more nuanced. This third eye of racism is ideological racism. And this is the racist belief system. And it's a system of belief that tends to reinforce or support or rationalize a racially inequitable society or some sort of racist policy. Let me give you a historical example. In the era of slavery in the United States, that practice in society of slavery was supported or reinforced or justified by these inaccurate beliefs that people of different racial groups were somehow more or less civilized. There were these beliefs that certain people were more civilized and could be in society and some were less and therefore needed to be controlled. Obviously we know that is ridiculous, but people believed that and it allowed them to accept this racially problematic system, this abhorrent system of slavery. So ideological racism is a belief system used to rationalize or support racist structures. Now, that ideological racism is often where the other forms of racism come from. The structures are built based on those ideologies and people are who become individually racist or interpersonally racist grow up in a society where that racist belief system sort of exists there. So in sum, prejudice is prejudging or having negative attitudes or opinions about someone based on a group that they're part of. Discrimination involves treatment that is unfavorable or unfair based on a group that someone is part of. And then racism, can be defined in many different ways, but we talked about the three eyes. Interpersonal, which are those individual acts of racism, institutional, which are racist structures, and ideological, which are larger racist belief systems that exist in a society. Thanks for watching. Be sure to click like and subscribe.